Today we are pleased to welcome you, invited members of Philippine media, in this media roundtable. Together with Dr. Ang Suping, Sanofi Pasteur's Global Head of Medical Affairs, and Professor Tiki Pang, who is presently visiting professor of the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy of the National University of Singapore. He was previously Director of Research and uh, Policy Cooperation and Cooperation of the World Health Organization in Geneva, Switzerland from 1999 to 2012. My name is Edwin Galvez and I'll be your moderator for this session. The new dengue vaccine introduced here in the Philippines last February is part of the continuum of Sanofi Pasteur's public health commitment in the Philippines. The aim of this session is to provide you in the media with a comprehensive background on the development and documentation of the clinical value of the dengue vaccine, as well as an in-depth understanding of the implementation guidelines for use of the vaccine in endemic settings like the Philippines. Both dengue and the dengue vaccine are complex and important topics that are often covered in the media, which is why we invited all of you today. Dengue is political and public health priority in the Philippines because it is a disease capable of disrupting our communities and crippling our healthcare systems. Today we will focus on the documented scientific and public health value of the dengue vaccine and guidelines for its use in endemic countries like ours. We ask you to keep your questions specific to this topic as we are not here to cover news on the vaccine per se, but rather to ensure, or ensure that your future coverage of dengue and dengue vaccination is balanced and evidence-based. And we'd also like to inform you that any question on the recent actions of the Philippine government, specifically the Department of Health, may not be addressed here in this forum and should be directly addressed to the DOH. Lastly, we hope you can ask your questions to our panelists as we will, be not be, we will not be able to do a one on one after the forum. So, we will open the session with a short presentation from each of our two panelists, followed by a short QA, and then open up for general discussion at the end of the session. We will begin with Dr. Su. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Ang Su Ping. Okay, can you hear me? So good evening everybody, and thank you very much for coming. Uh, on behalf of Senator Castro, I really thank you uh, for making Dengue uh, topic of interest for, for the Philippines and yourselves. First of all, I just want to ask you a question. By show of hands, how many of you in this room, either personally or with your immediate family circle, have been touched by dengue in your lives? Okay, so that's actually the majority in this room. And you're going to see, of course, the slides are going to actually tell you why dengue is so relevant in the Philippines, why dengue vaccination prevention is so relevant in the Philippines. And, and with you know, what has Sanofi Buster been doing over the last 20 years to help to bring a new solution to the fight against dengue. So we live in this red belt, right? It's the tropical belt tropical and subtropical region where half of the world's population living are at risk of dengue. And really this has been a story that has been growing increasingly over the last 30 years. The burden of dengue has actually increased 50-fold. 
So 50 years ago, maybe only nine countries had dengue endemic, and now we have more than 100 countries around the world. We see here that this is, in fact, the WHO has called this an urgent public health priority. If you look at the half the 3.9 billion people living in dengue endemic countries around the world, that results in approximately 390 million people infected with dengue each year. Now, of course, not everyone who is infected may actually realize they're infected because sometimes the symptoms can be mild. So, in fact, in terms of 100 million, there are 100 million symptomatic infections estimated each year around the world and of which half a million of these people require hospitalization due to severe dengue. It is in fact due to the efforts of the clinical medical community that this mortality rate is so low because over the last decades, we have learned that if you treat dengue, if you treat it early enough and you, you really aggressively manage the patient, you can really help the patient overcome the, the rough of dengue and in, uh, in order to recover, because there is no specific treatment for the virus itself, all you can do is support the patient. So for those of you who might have experienced it or who might know someone, you know they need a fluid resuscitation, really, to keep their bodies safe, to, in order to stop bleeding, for instance, so that they could recover gradually as their body took over, okay? So the WHO highlighting that these were really, really urgent public health priorities set in 2012 these objectives that by 2020 we should try to reduce the mortality by 50% at least and the morbidity by 25% at least. And in fact, we have been working for the last 20 years on trying to develop a dengue vaccine. Mm -hmm. Starting right here in Southeast Asia with the Mahidol University in Thailand and gradually using the resources of our research and development groups, our technical groups with respect to manufacturing and production of vaccines, um, resulting in various clinical studies, and in fact in 2010 gaining fast track status with the US FDA, and then very rapidly uh, in 2011, in fact in the Philippines five years ago, we were able to start the first phase three clinical trial. Um, and of course, we then saw results coming through from phase 2B trials in Thailand and also subsequently in 2014, phase 3 trials from both Asia and Latin America being published. The rest in 2015, you also know, we then started filing registration for our vaccine. So this has been a really intensive effort, but by no means would we say that we're really necessarily done because even in, in, in clinical development, we spent 10 years or more uh, doing clinical studies, but even when the vaccine is introduced, we continue to assess the vaccine uh, when it's been in wide use. So this is an effort that we as a company, we do for all our vaccines, and then it will be no different as well. So let's talk a little bit about our clinical development program. Uh, in fact, 25 clinical studies, 15 countries, some of them are still ongoing, and a total of over 40,000 subjects having been involved in the clinical studies. What you should note, of course, is the Philippines' unique role, along with the Mexico, of having been involved in all three phases of the vaccine's clinical development. In fact, here are the cities that were involved in the phase one, two, and three trials. And so this is really something to, again, highlight the strengths of the Philippines medical research and the clinical researchers here who really have experience with the expertise that they have. You actually have homegrown global experts right here in the Philippines on dengue and on the vaccine. So what have our results shown? So we published these data uh, from our clinical trials in phase three figures, but of course, if you have more questions later, I'm happy to address them. That overall, 65.6% .6 reduction in symptomatic dengue. That is dengue that is out of the community, a febrile illness. But what's more important is 
in terms of severe dengue, now you all know severe dengue comes with the warnings that potentially the patient might have uncontrollable bleeding, might go into uh, difficulties with respect to their fluid balance and, and their blood pressure. And we, pre we managed to show prevention of 9 out of 10 severe cases of dengue and any hospitalized case 8 out of 10. So these were the first results that we showed in the population 9 to 16 years of age across both Latin America as well as in Asia. What is also important to note, and I don't show you the figures here, is that we were able to demonstrate efficacy against all four strains of the dengue virus. We were also able to show that the vaccine works even in those who have been never <coughs> exposed to dengue before. So the vaccine is working whether or not the individual has encountered dengue before. What about safety? So across all of our clinical trial data, we have gathered safety data and integrated all of that into an analysis of 21,000 individuals aged 9 to 60. And the typical types of adverse reactions or side effects you might expect from any vaccine, you might you get injection site pain, you might get headache a few days, you might feel a little bit achy for a few days. Nothing major or serious was identified. And we really saw very, very comparable results between the vaccine and also the placebo group. And we also saw no real differences if you were looking at the vaccinations in the younger population versus the older population. We didn't see any differences if you were male or female, where you were living. Um, and as I said before, whether or not you'd encountered dengue before, there were no differences in terms of the safety profile. What's also important to note is now our clinical trials have gone on and they're now in the fifth year of follow-up. And already up to years three and four, after the first dose of vaccination, we continue to see that the rates of dengue hospitalization remain lower in those who have been vaccinated than those who have not been vaccinated. So really giving us an assurance that now that we've already got three, four years of data, we're still seeing this effect, this reduction in dengue hospitalizations persisting. Where are we now in terms of our approval status? So we have already submitted a regulatory file in more than 20 countries. And you know, of course, that the first countries to register were Mexico and quickly followed by the Philippines. Um, that, so altogether nine countries around the world, two in Asia and seven in Latin America. Brazil and the Philippines here are the first two that have introduced uh, the, the dengue vaccine into an immunization program. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about the Philippines program. And so will uh, Professor Pang as well. Now, these two introductions have been completely in line with the recent WHO position where they recommended that countries should consider introduction of the dengue vaccine in geographic settings where the epidemiological data indicate a high burden of disease. So what is the burden in the Philippines? Back in about 2012, the WHO had gathered this data from 2004 to 2010, and the Philippines was ranked seven out of the top 10. In fact, it's fourth in Asia in terms of dengue burden, dengue incidence. And these data here, this is showing you an average over this time frame of about 54,000 cases per year. However, if you look at more recent data, which is on this chart here, this is tracking from 95 all the way to 2014. If you look at the last few years, that burden is now much higher. So the average number of cases each year is no longer 50,000. It's hitting the hundreds of thousands. This year alone, I think as of this month, uh, in the Philippines, what's been recorded or in the surveillance system is already over 100,000 cases. So we're not even through the rest of the year. And of course, we do note that there are differences in terms of the rates of especially hospitalization in the Philippines. And here you're seeing that in the younger population, especially below the age of 20, this is where the incidence is the highest. However, if you look just at the population age from 9 to 45 years of age, that's about 65% of the hospitalized dengue cases in the Philippines each year, 9 to 45. So 
it really is a disease that really impacts the Philippines and it's a growing disease. What is also important to note is that, as you know, there are four dengue strains that circulate and they circulate throughout the years and they can be a bit unpredictable. One year, you might have more of one particular type or not, but you always see, you can see all four strains typically tend to circulate throughout each season. And the other thing to note on this chart here, this is showing you seasonality. So from January to December, and you see that this is in the more recent years, in the last few years, this is your typical season. And this is, the, of course, the rainy part of the, of the year. And it's no surprise, the mosquitoes like to the, the, the water in, in to thrive. And that is when you get this peak of dengue disease. What this does to your healthcare system is if you imagine that people are all getting disease in these months, is it really overcrowds the hospitals, it burdens the health system. Because as I said before, in order to really manage dengue and its mortality, or its, in terms of avoiding death due to dengue, you really need to watch your patients very, very closely and treat them very, very aggressively. If they need hospitalization, they need to go in and get fluid therapies. So that really puts a burden on the healthcare system. What does it mean in terms of costs? So this is an analysis that was published using the Philippines data. And it estimates, so what, what you will see here is a breakdown of what are the, the healthcare related costs. And in fact, 90% of the costs come from hospitalized cases, so that is no surprise. 10% of the costs from the outpatient or ambulatory cases. And, and if you look at a cost per case, so these are unfortunately euros, so you have to do a bit of a conversion. But if you look at how much it costs per hospital case, it's 543 euros per hospitalized case. If you then multiply that by how many cases you expect in the Philippines each year, that is a staggering 16.7 billion pesos. So this is the cost burden in terms of healthcare costs due to dengue in the Philippines. Not counted is what is the loss of productivity from the people who do die. Of course, it's not so many, but still there is a cost to society from this. And of course, there are always ongoing costs because you still have to control the vector. You still have to invest in controlling the mosquitoes. Not factored in are some other potentially hidden, sometimes uh, very difficult to estimate, but you know, if it's a particularly bad season and if people start avoiding the country for that time of year because of the fear of dengue, then you get loss in tourism, etc. So these are all costs that can add up but are not really uh, obvious, right? So in fact, the Philippines has really done a textbook uh, case for uh, where is the burden of disease highest? In fact, these three regions that have introduced the dengue vaccine program happen to be the highest, amongst the highest in the Philippines in terms of dengue burden. Um, and using a school-based program, what really we have to congratulate uh, the Department of Health really <coughs> is in terms of achieving 67% uh, coverage in four months. That is 489,003 grade four students all vaccinated by the end of July with their first dose. This really is remarkable. I'm going to ask Professor Pang to also comment on this later in terms of how does this rate compare with other countries? Because I would I would say to you this is this is really a remarkable achievement. It is a very difficult job to organize this sort of a program so quickly and to do it with so with so much efficiency. So really, this is. Another dimension in which the Philippines can set a benchmark for other endemic countries. So in summary, we started the, the dengue vaccination journey or development of a dengue vaccine prevention 20 years ago. But we had in mind that we wanted the vaccine to be introduced first in the places around the world that needed it the most. We call this flipping the model because the traditional model has been start your vaccine registrations and introductions in, say, the United States or in Europe, and then gradually take it into perhaps Asia and Latin America. But in this case, in the case of dengue, where the burden is so great here, 
this really was our public health imperative as well, to make sure that the countries that needed it the most would get it first. So with a breakthrough innovation with the first dengue vaccine, you see that we have managed to achieve licenses now in nine of the most dengue endemic countries. Ongoing submissions are still in other countries. And vaccination strategies are being defined as in the Philippines with, this, with different needs according to what, what is needed to optimize the impact from dengue. And all of this has been also supported by the World Health Organization, which has issued its position, a very carefully considered position that endorses the safety, the efficacy, and the public health value of vaccines in highly endemic countries. And really, when I say in terms of flipping the model with the dengue vaccine, it is really the Philippines that is the test case that proves it can be done. So indeed, you know, if, if there is something for you to also feel proud of, uh, this is really something that the Philippines can showcase. As I highlighted before as well, your clinical research standards, the experts that you have locally, the fact that you, you have the, the capabilities to run such an impressive school-based program, all of these are really hallmarks uh, of a very successful implementation for the Philippines. With that, I open the floor to questions that you might have. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Su. The floor is now open for your questions. George, you may uh, introduce yourselves from which uh, outlet you come from and the question. Hi, good evening, Doctor. I'm uh, George Drew from Abante. I'd just like to know who are the ideal candidates for vaccination and can the vaccine be used by both children and adults? So, so you will see from our license indication that the vaccine is licensed for the age of 9 to 45 in the Philippines. So this is really the, the, the age that the department, uh, the regulatory agency here, in the, the, the FDA here in the Philippines has, has licensed the vaccine for, and this is the indication for, for the vaccine here in the Philippines. Yeah. You have a follow-up question. Uh, are there certain, um, um, are there certain individuals when giving the vaccine is contraindicated, you know, sure. people with certain diseases or other ailments who can't take sure. the vaccine. Sure. So, as it as is the case with a number of live vaccines, um, there are contraindications, especially in those who might be immunocompromised, for example, uh, in pregnancy as well. Um, so, indeed, yes. So, th there are these contraindications. Those those who have uh, immune uh, disorders like HIV, etc. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, George. Any other question? So while you're formulating your questions, may I just put it out uh, in the open? This particular question, here in the Philippines, uh, there were reports that there is increased risks, risks of severe disease or hospitalization of after the vaccine is administered to those who have not had dengue before. Can you comment on this? So I don't, I don't show you a slide specifically about um, how the vaccine is made, but it's important to note it is a live vaccine, but it's what we call a, an attenuated vaccine. So it's very, very weakened. But also importantly, um, it's, it's, a, it's basically using an existing vaccine that has been used for decades now, the yellow fever vaccine. And then it's actually combining with DNA technology um, the, the specific proteins from the dengue virus so that you have a virus that you can use as a vaccine and that produces a, a response in the human body that fights a dengue infection. The vaccine itself cannot cause dengue. So the vaccine itself is not a dengue virus, therefore it cannot cause dengue. It is teaching the human immune system to produce the antibodies that can then fight when a dengue infection comes. And indeed, in our indicated population from the age of nine and above, when you look at the safety profile, this analysis that I've shown that's been published of 21,000 individuals aged nine to 60 years of age, we have not seen, you see this, um, we have not seen any increased rates of dengue hospitalization up to three, up to four years of, of our clinical trials so far. Um. I'm Joel Adriano from SIDEP. 
Um, just a clarification on uh, is this the is this vaccine a one shot vaccine or should you um, continue with it like it's like a flu vaccine that you get for it <coughs> each year? So so what what I should point out is that the schedule of the vaccine is that you need to have three doses. You need to have three doses six months apart. Okay. And then a, a follow up question. Uh, what would you suggest if say a person already has about uh, dengue twice, so probably got to uh, strain already, uh, is it still advisable to have a vaccine if you already have about two or three uh, strain already? Okay, so, so what, what we do know, as I said, we have four dengue strains that circulate. So any anybody can actually, if you're exposed, uh, get dengue infection four times. Typically, if you've already been back, uh, uh, you've already had the dengue disease from one serotype, you won't get disease again from that, that same serotype. But you can still be infected with the other three serotypes. So, of course, it's not quite the same as, um, and then you have a higher risk of a second <coughs> infection uh, that could be more serious. So it does, of course, come back down to an individual choice if they want to protect themselves against potentially the next <coughs> the third or the fourth infection. Thank you, Joel. Yeah, hi, Chris Chu from Manila Bulletin. Um, I just wanted to ask because on both Dengue and Zika are Aedes aegypti, so will taking this vaccine also protect you from Zika? No. So this this specific, as I said before, in terms of how how we made the vaccine, um, it uses the back the, the, the sh basically the the main body of the vaccine is using the yellow fever vaccine virus, and then it has certain parts of the proteins from the dengue uh, virus, which teaches the, the, the body to recognize dengue and, and then fight the infection if, if it encounters it. It doesn't have the same proteins as in Zika, so we don't necessarily expect that it would then protect against Zika. So that's, uh, but again, th this technology can of course be used to help us in developing a, a Zika vaccine. Edson from uh, uh, International Tribune. I just like to ask if a person is a carrier of a person that is sick of uh, dengue and he gets vaccinated, what would be the effect on him or her? So, wait, I just want to clarify. So, if a, if a person has never encountered dengue before? But he, he or she is a carrier. A carrier. Um, I guess that in terms of what we know of, of dengue, uh, the infection is such that you would typically have a, uh, an infection, then you you clear you clear the infection. So it's not known that uh, any particular individual would carry the virus for a prolonged period of time. Yeah. Thank you. <coughs> Hi, uh, I'm Lorisa. I am a, I'm a mom actually. Uh, my concern would be if just just in case there's a slight reaction to my kid when he or she took the vaccine, what symptoms should I watch for that would, you know, um, say that there's something wrong with my, my children? So, so my advice would be in, in, in our clinical trials, we didn't see any um, unusual sorts of side effects. Um, such as, and the typical ones are, uh, for children especially, mm -hmm. perhaps they would get the pain, some children may get more fever, adults mm -hmm. typically don't get so much fever, etc. But in any case, as a mom, mm -hmm. if you're ever concerned about anything that your child is encountering, whether or not it could have been related to receiving a vaccine, mm -hmm. the advice would be you should seek medical attention because you know your child best and you know when something isn't, isn't going well. Because we can never predict uh, if, if sometimes uh, certain conditions may occur mm -hmm. just because of, of other factors and not necessarily related to, to the vaccine. So the best advice is if you're ever in doubt, if you ever have a concern, you should seek your doctor's Doctor help. Yeah. <coughs> um, good evening. How much is the vaccine in where can we get it? Uh, so I don't have the specifics about where exactly you can get it, so uh, I would perhaps pass it on to Dr. Rubai. 
Good evening, I'm Dr. Ruby Dizon. I'm the Medical Director for Sanofi Pasteur in the Philippines. Um, for that uh, question, I would just like to encourage you to please go to your private doctors and you can avail of it more, more or less in most of the doctors here in Manila. Any other questions? Yes, that's a question. Hi, I'm Lou from Langan Club. My concern is about even if you get the right doses of vaccination, is there a recurrence of dengue fever? So, of course, no vaccine can ever be. It's 8 out of 10. But again, it's not 100%. So, the same sort of um, advice would be to anyone yeah. not to be complacent. Of course, if you yeah. think you have a serious condition, always to seek medical attention. That, that would be the best advice. But of course, you know, this is the data that we have shown in our clinical trials um, after 25 months upon the first dose. Hi, uh, my name is JR. Um, JR is the market. I'm a blogger at keepingno.com. Um, I just like to know, just for uh, maybe just zero on the dengue per se. Uh, is it, are we somewhere along the lines of bringing dengue into a more common type of sickness already? Or is it still a grave um, disease that could still evolve to something worse and something to fear later on? Well, the, the, the part that I think is, as I highlighted before, is that, you know, back. I think when dengue first emerged, perhaps decades ago, 30 odd years ago, and people didn't know so much about how to treat it, that was when actually children died. The mortality was pretty high. because, And then over time, especially uh, in Thailand and also here in the Philippines and Southeast Asia, the doctors started realizing if they managed the patient very, very well in the early days, they really managed to recover. And over time now, the rates of deaths have really dramatically fallen. So I think dengue is one of those diseases that we just cannot be complacent about because you cannot predict who might evolve into a more severe case. So you always have to be vigilant. And, and I don't think this should change even if one has been vaccinated. How different would it be from other diseases? Like, you know, example, like, remember about, you know, start to work tuberculosis, it was a big thing, and but now it's already manageable. But it's, it's, I think it's come to a point where it's, it's totally manageable, right? I mean, nobody dies from tuberculosis anymore. Or is there still a lot of deaths coming in? But well, this is this is one of the things about public health, and I think I think Professor Tang can, can also elaborate further on this. Is that you know, once you introduce vaccination and you reduce the, the incidence of the disease, it often is the time when people become complacent. And unfortunately, we have learned the hard way that complacency doesn't pay. We have learned the hard way with the resurgence of measles, for example. You stop vaccinating against measles, I'm sorry, but it comes back. And then you start seeing deaths again due to measles. So it's, it's, it's really, really a, a key message that although you don't see the disease anymore, it can't take it for granted. Yeah. Thank you. Um, another question. Um, I'm just wondering um, if you have any idea why exactly that among the countries, seven are, are actually coming from the Latin America side and just only two from Asia. Uh, and it seems that they are more kind of uh, accepting about the, the dengue vaccine than those from Asia. Any reason for that? I. We haven't seen that um, Asian or Latin American regulators have different levels of acceptance. All the regulators in the dengue endemic countries have been very keen to receive the submission from Santa Fe Pasteur. What is different in every country, and that's true for any vaccine or any drug, is that their own individual FDAs will have their own different processes. So each regulatory agency has to follow its own due process. So some of them take longer, some of them can go faster. Some of them can take an approval from one country and sort of carry it over and say, therefore, I approve it. But it, it's definitely, it should not be taken as a sign that uh, Asian countries don't uh, accept the dengue vaccine because every regulator we've spoken with, um, you know, they've all received the file and they've all been really uh, attentive to re reviewing the file. So, can I comment on that question? Um, 
just a comment on, on that question. Why Latin America is seven in Asia only too. When I was at WHO, I was always struck by the extent of solidarity amongst the Latin American countries. They're very similar cultures. They're all Spanish speaking. They're all mostly Catholic, except for Brazil, of course, which is Portuguese. But they're all at about the same level of development. So culturally, linguistically, everything, they're about the same. And with regards to vaccine, going back 40, 50 years, they've always had that solidarity. Whereas if you look at this region, it's much more diverse, you know, from culture, from language, or levels of economic development. There are much more differences in this region than there are in Latin America. That's just my own personal view that perhaps explains why the Latin Americans have been much more rapid and the solidarity is much stronger. Okay. Just a personal view. Thank you, Professor Pan. We have one last question from Edsel, and then we'll proceed with uh, Professor Pang's presentation. Oh, I was just wondering, for those people who have had uh, other kinds of vaccinations, like for the fever and so on and so forth, um, do they need to see a doctor to be advised before they have the vaccination for dengue? Um, so we definitely haven't, uh, uh, you know, when we did our clinical trials, um, many of the, the patients who were enrolled in the clinical trials, the participants who, who came into the clinical trials, they would have received their own normal vaccines. So the children would have received their usual vaccines prior to entering the trial. So there was, there's no sort of exclusion that if you've received a particular uh, vaccine before, you should not receive any vaccine. Not at all. So. Thank you. We will have uh, your questions later on when we again have the two panelists uh, later. For now, we proceed with the presentation of uh, Professor Tiki Pan. Um, I think Su Ping has given you a presentation on the nuts and bolts of the vaccine. Um, she especially highlighted the situation in the Philippines. Uh, that it really is a serious public health problem. <clears throat> what I'm going to highlight is the problem is not just in the Philippines. Okay, Almost all the countries in this region, I would say all the countries in the region, have the same problem with dengue. So what is actually happening? Why? Why is dengue become such a big global problem? 30, 54 increase just in the last 30 years. Several reasons for this. Firstly, are the forces of globalization, okay? Increased travel, tourism, trade, urbanization, rise of big cities like Manila with its famous traffic jams, okay? And importantly, climate change, global warming. The recent El Nino phenomenon, where there is an increase in global temperatures, definitely you're gonna have more mosquitoes, which as we know, spreads dengue. You can't treat dengue, as Supeng has mentioned in the same way that you can give antibiotics to someone who's suffering from TB, for example. Mosquito control is not working well. Take a country like Singapore. It has very rigorous, very vigorous, puts a lot of money into mosquito control. And yet, they still have banking outputs. Importantly, the actual number of cases is probably much higher than those being reported. And I'll come back to this. And importantly, in many developing countries, the problem is made much worse because most of these countries have weak and fragile healthcare systems. So when you have an outbreak, a surge during the season, your healthcare delivery system is in trouble. Just going back on this issue of underreporting. A study done in 2013 by Dr. Bart and his colleagues tried to analyze this question of underestimation. And one of the questions he posed was, what would have been the scenario in 2010 in the Philippines? And the answer to that question was that in 2010, for every case of dengue reported, 40 went unreported, right? 
And that is true, not just for the Philippines, but for every other country that has dengue. In India, I read one estimate that says they are underestimating by a factor of 300. Okay, so what we're seeing clearly is the tip of an iceberg here. So, therefore, given all these issues, and if you look at the long term, vaccines to prevent dengue are the best weapon that we have to fight this global public health problem. So, you've heard from Suping that we now potentially have a vaccine that can make a difference. But before such a vaccine is introduced in a country, there are some questions that perhaps people who make decisions in government, in the Ministry of Health, need to ask before they go ahead and introduce. I'm speaking sort of very generally here, based on the WHO guidelines for introduction of new vaccines. What are some of these questions? I just want to share this with you. What is the size of the problem that the vaccine is aiming to prevent? If you have 20 cases a year, there's no case, right? Next question, what is the scientific evidence that it actually works and that it is safe? Another important question. Informed by independent experts, is there guidance and endorsement from credible international organizations? In this case, the most relevant is the WHO, the World Health Organization. And very importantly, of course, how much will it cost? Is it sustainable in the long term? Not just for one year, two years, but 20, 30 years. So those are some of the, the key questions. And let me elaborate a little bit on the issue of evidence and endorsement. I'm a scientist by training, so I'm a great believer that any decision should first and foremost be based on scientific evidence. In the case of the dengue vaccine, as Su Ping has mentioned, that there is very strong scientific evidence of safety and efficacy. And these scientific results have been published in the top international medical journals after very careful evaluation and review by independent experts. So it's not people from Sarafi Pasteur that review it, but independent experts. Beyond the results from the clinical trials that Suping mentioned, there have also been many other studies. I'm just mentioning this one, very recently published, which uses a mathematical modeling approach to analyze the benefits and the, the risks of that particular dengue vaccine in order to inform how to optimally deploy the vaccine. And mathematical modeling in recent times has been proven to be a very powerful tool because of the increase in computing power, because of the increase in data availability. And many, many different models have been used to analyze many aspects of dengue vaccine, including the impact, including risk and benefit, and including even cost benefit. So going on to endorsement, what does the WHO do when there is a new vaccine? It uses a process called SAGE, which is a strategic advisory group of experts on immunizations. These are invited experts, independent, invited in their own personal capacity because they're the leading scientists in their field. So in the case of the live attenuated dengue vaccine that we've been talking about, this committee will carefully look at all the scientific evidence related to that vaccine. They will carefully analyze, review, criticize the data, ask questions, etc., etc. And after, I think, following about a two-year process, the working group then issues recommendations about this vaccine, which will guide the countries planning to use it. And you've already seen this slide before. In July 2016, the SAGE came up with uh, some recommendations. There are many of these recommendations. I'm just going to highlight the one that Su Ping has already highlighted, which is introduce the dengue vaccine only in countries and regions where data indicate high endemicity and burden of disease. And that clearly applies to the Philippines, as uh, Su Ping has mentioned. So 
going back to the questions that government decision makers need to ask, you've already seen uh, these four, but there's a fifth one that I haven't mentioned, which is just as important. And that is, will it benefit the people and the country? In other words, what is the public health value of the vaccine? That clearly is a very important question. And if you pose that question, what is actually the health and public health benefits of vaccination? You come up with the following. Of course, it will protect individuals from illness. And in the case of severe disease, it will protect him or her from death. More importantly though, from a public health angle, is that it gives indirect protection for the whole population. Because if you use the vaccine, if the vaccine works, it reduces the spread of the disease in the community. And sometimes we won't get there. People focus on individual protection, they forget about protecting the whole population. There would be, if the vaccine has been implemented uh, well, a decrease of the overall incidence and the number of cases. cases. And also important, hopefully it will end up in a reduction in both the frequency and the size of outbreaks. Now, if that happens, of course, you have less stress on your healthcare system, and there are clearly economic and social benefits that Suping's already uh, alluded to. What now? Okay, so we potentially have a good vaccine. Okay, but for it to actually make a difference, clearly you need to think more practically. All right, the development's been done, the innovation has been done, vaccine is ready, but what you clearly need is an implementation plan. Okay, now you're getting to the, to the sort of the requirements for this vaccine to be successful. And there are quite a few of these, I'll just go through it quickly. It must consider, for example, the capacity in the country for diagnostics. You need to be able to identify the cases and importantly, take care of those who get sick, manage them, okay? You have to have capacity for accurate monitoring and surveillance of cases as well as adverse, adverse events following vaccination. I think the, the, some of the questions alluded to the importance of that. What about coverage? How is the vaccine going to be rolled out? What is the strategy for that? Is it going to be school-based like what's been done in the Philippines? Is it going to be community outreach? Is, is it going to be vaccination in facilities? Whatever. Are there going to be catch-up or follow-up campaigns? Is the vaccine going to be used during outbreaks? These are all sort of implementation uh, issues. Importantly, there has to be, as part of the plan, public engagement, education, awareness raising, and ownership to make sure that the vaccine is accepted by the people. Absolutely critical. It has to be integrated with existing mosquito control programs. The vaccine is not a substitute for mosquito control. It has to be integrated. They're complementary. There has to be clearly money, adequate and sustainable financing for any program. And another important dimension that's sometimes forgotten is there has to be equitable, affordable, and sustainable access. It is very bad if only the rich in the population can afford to get the vaccine, okay? So the equity angle, very important. And finally, there has to be ability, there has to be an ability within the plan to evaluate the impact and value of the program. The question is, did it really work? Did it really make a difference? And people forget to do that sometimes, okay? And the value of that is that it will provide information in a feedback loop to improve the future plans, all right? So just also, um, just to mention that an implementation toolkit is actually available uh, to help countries develop these uh, implementation uh, plans. Okay. So let's say you have a good implementation plan, you've got all these bases covered. Is it enough? The answer is no. I want you to think of successful implementation as having to move a mountain. What do you need? 
to move that mountain. Oh, sorry, I forgot to mention that in this particular dimension of public engagement, this is where the media clearly plays or has a very, very important role. Okay, so I was talking about the mountain. Okay, what do you need to move that mountain that will successfully introduce the vaccine? What you need is a triangle. Okay, this is a concept which some of you may have heard called the triangle that moves the mountain. This was proposed by Professor Wasi of Thailand uh, many, many years ago. And he said that to move the mountain, you need a triangle that has three corners. The first one is the creation and use of knowledge. And you have seen with the dengue vaccine that this, the knowledge and the science foundation is very strong. You need social movement. Okay, I've highlighted the importance of public engagement and acceptance and the role of the media in ensuring that that happens. And very importantly, the third corner of the triangle, you need political commitment. Okay, the science alone, the social movement alone is not enough. You need political commitment. And in my own personal view, the importance of political commitment has been very much illustrated by the example of the Philippines. <coughs> first country in Asia to license the vaccine in December 2015 and in April 2016, the launch of the school immunization program. And as Suping mentioned, it's a remarkable achievement on the part of the country. From my point of view, what's even more remarkable is the fact that this has happened in the face of concerns and uncertainties. The questions that you ask, Let's face it, okay? This is not a perfect vaccine. That's reflected in the questions that you ask. What I want to say to you is that the idea of a perfect vaccine is a myth, okay? It's just not achievable. With any new vaccine, with any new drug, with any new medical device, there are bound to be concerns, risks, and uncertainties. And in the case of the dengue vaccine, Many of you know what these concerns are, and you reflected that in your questions. Concerns around efficacy, concerns around safety, especially in young children, concerns around suitability of the vaccine in certain countries or certain regions. How long is the protection going to last? Somebody asked that question about do you need repeated doses? And of course, concern about the price. Somebody asked how much is it going to cost? Okay, so these are legitimate concerns, okay, that has been expressed and gets a lot of sort of attention. However, in the case of the Philippines, the decision makers in government went ahead despite these concerns. Why? Once again, this is my own personal view. They went ahead because they believe that the price of inaction is far greater than the cost of making a mistake. I also think they believe that what we fear doing most is usually what we most need to do. So once again, I'm, I'm an unabashed admirer of how the Philippines have implemented the school-based immunization. I believe it's a demonstration of political commitment, leadership, vision, and importantly, courage. And this was captured very nicely by Dr. Lyndon Nisui from your Department of Health, who said at a meeting a few months ago in Bangkok, why license the vaccine if I'm not going to use it? To me, that's courage. Courage that, as Suping mentioned, that many, many countries will be able to learn from. You, you're a benchmark. You're a pioneer. So the benefit is not just to the Philippines, but to the rest of the world. The Philippines' contribution to the world will happen through regional sharing of experiences and knowledge on implementation, maybe leading to best practices and implementation guidelines, global dissemination and contribution of such knowledge through scientific publications authored by Filipino researchers. And as, as Suping mentioned, you have great capacity, great knowledge, great experience, um, much more than any country in the West in the context of research on Delhi. And doing this will cement the Philippines' pioneering role and leadership in dealing 
with a major uh, public health problem. So it's a contribution to the world from the Philippines. Let me end by saying that despite this very important contribution, at the end of the day, the most important benefit is to your own people. And uh, my last slide is a quotation from your ninth president, Diosdado Macapagal, who said, the strength of the nation lies in the well-being of the common man. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for uh, your time. You know, I will open the floor to your question. <laughs> you have uh, practically uh, exhausted the uh, address so, so, so all the concerns. So, so things gets, gets all the hard questions. <laughs> or perhaps we can go back to Dr. Supin. Yes, uh, any, any, any questions? Most welcome. Professor Tang, good evening. I'd just like to know if there's any statistic that you can quote. Um, is there like a certain number of like a ratio of individuals in a country that needs to be vaccinated for it to be considered, um, you know, it's going to be uh, the whole country's going, it, it, it's effective for the whole country. Like, is there like a 50% of the population has to be vaccinated? For us to see the first, um, for, it, for us to see the efficacy of the vaccine. Uh, that, that that's a good question, and you said statistics, okay? Yeah, if there's uh, like an idea. Yeah, I, I don't think there's actually a benchmark, okay? And I think the the quick answer is that for each country, the situation is going to be different, depending on on the prevalence, the amount of uh, people who have been exposed previously to the to the vaccine. The quick answer to your question is that um, the longer term measure or outcome is the reduction in the number of cases. And that can take you know, quite a few years from the introduction of the vaccine. But in terms of, of, of coverage, of course, you would try, once you identify your target group, you would try to, ident to achieve the highest level of coverage, like in the Philippines case, you achieve 67% in four months in that particular age group. Now, that figure clearly would be different and much more difficult to achieve if you are trying to immunize the whole population. So there's no hard and fast answer, but the ultimate measure is, you know, over the years that you monitor following vaccination, whether you actually see a reduction in incidence. That's the ultimate measure of the effectiveness of the vaccine. Can I just add one point? Sure. Yeah. So Professor Pam mentioned the importance of some of the mathematical models. And in fact, we do, we have some mathematical models that have looked at if you only vaccinate perhaps one age group, or if you vaccinate one age group, and then you have some catch ups, right? Yeah. Um, and indeed, of course, it's no surprise, the more you vaccinate, the more the impact. So one of the models, uh, and we can of course share the publication with you, <coughs> illustrates that if you took the 10 countries where we did the clinical trials uh, in Latin America and in Asia, and you vaccinated 20% of the population in those uh, countries, then you could impact dengue by 50%. So it's, it, it will depend on how, how, how many cohorts you vaccinate, so how many age groups you vaccinate, and how fast you go for it. Because of course, if you take your time gradually, the, the, the impact will come, but it will come slower. So it's a matter of what is the priority? Do you want to hit it fast and hard? And can you have the capacity to in indeed cover as many people as possible? And in Brazil, one particular uh, uh, state that has announced that it has already started its program, they have one of the highest rates of, of dengue in that country. And they've decided to, to in fact, vaccinate in, in some of their municipalities um, 15 to 27 years of, of the children 15 from 15 up to adults 27 years of age. Two of the municipalities are going so far as, as vaccinating 9 to 44. So really a very, very large program that they want to, to go for. But that really is, again, you know, courage, commitment, leadership, uh, coming to, to where Professor Pang is indicating, but also what is the objective? in terms of really aggressively targeting dengue prevention. And, and remember, this is a brand new vaccine, so you do not really have data, real data to, to base it on. And the modeling is very, very useful 
but a model is a model. It has many, many assumptions. Although I would say that the quality and the rigor of the modeling has increased many, many fold over the last uh, 10 years or so. So it is a, a very useful adjunct, okay, in the absence of evidence, because it's a brand new vaccine. You know, you don't have that historical data to look at. So uh, the, the modeling uh, analysis is a very useful adjunct to help uh, uh, decision makers to try to at least, I wouldn't say forecast, but you know, maybe get an idea of what might happen. Yeah, um, just a follow-up question. I, I forget where I read it, but I read somewhere that there was a country that declared itself free of malaria. So in the scientific community, when you say a country is free of a certain disease, how many years do you usually, how many years um, does a country need to report that no disease has been logged for, for the scientific community to say a disease has been free? Uh, sorry, a country has been free of that particular disease. I would really challenge a country who says they are completely free of malaria. Okay, I think um, uh, a disease which is uh, transmitted by a mosquito, which is the case for malaria, as the case for dengue, for Zika, you will never ever be able to confidently say that you've got rid, you've gotten rid of malaria or dengue. I just think it's a, it's just not possible. Okay, but you may remember that um, during Ebola, there was a WHO guideline that said that if a country sees no case of Ebola after 42 days, I believe that was the number, then they could say the epidemic was over. But it doesn't say that they've gotten rid of the disease. Okay, general knowledge. What is the only disease that has been su successfully eradicated from the surface of the earth? On smallpox, okay? That's the only one, all right? They talked about polio being the next one. Hasn't happened. They talked about measles. Hasn't happened because of the issues that Supreme has highlighted. Complacency, people, you know, become uh, blasé about vaccination. And another issue which I'm not sure whether I should raise it here. Um, I was talking to Dr. Rose Kapadik, who was one of the primary uh, researchers. And she said another reason for sometimes people being complacent or people being suspicious of vaccines is a growing anti-vaccination movement. Okay, and apparently it is happening in this part of the world as well. I know that in Europe it's very, very strong. In the US it's quite strong. Okay, but that is once again the role of the media. You must be able to counter all these untruths that these anti-vaccination groups are saying about the dangers of vaccination. And I'm pretty sure when it comes to dengue, they will say, and they have a lot of things to pick up on, some of the things that you already mentioned. So that, that's another reason, you know, to keep up your guard, because there are people for, you know, totally unscientific reasons that will say vaccines are dangerous, you know. But once again, that's my own personal view as someone who believes in vaccine and someone who believes in public health. Thank you. Hi, I'm Anel from the Philippine Daily Inquirer. Um, just regarding the cost, uh, comparing the price of the vaccine to what you would spend for treatment and hospi hospitalization when you get dengue, how much would one be able to save? Wow, the issue of price is something I'm not going to address, but my own ballpark guess you will save at least 80 to 90 percent on the cost and Supin mentioned it costs 530 euros if you end up in hospital i'm pretty sure the vaccine is not going to cost 530 euros but i'm not going to say anything because you know the son of the people uh, have more ideas about the indication of price but i would say it's at least 80 or 90 percent that you would see am i right <laughs> contradict me please well it's just a ballpark i'm sure i'm not too far off you know, price is a very difficult issue to answer because it depends on, you know, volume, it depends on country, whatever. <laughs> Thank you, Doc. Uh, Professor Pang. Any other question uh, for Professor Pang? Joel? Um, just a, a simple one. 
uh, earlier you mentioned about the implementation plan and you said uh, to ensure um, acceptance, part of it would be an ownership. What exactly do you mean by ownership? Okay, um, I think once again I cite uh, the example of Singapore, okay, which has been very successful in the context of public engagement and community involvement. Um, and one example of, of ownership is that in the effort to control mosquitoes, for example, okay, the same could be for vaccination, they actually recruit people from the community to be these so-called dengue fighters. So in other words, the battle against dengue is owned by the members of the community itself, right? So they play a very important role as eyes and ears about what's happening within the communities, especially in the hotspots that are known to have dengue. One example is they developed an app where these dengue fighters can actually take photographs of potential breeding sites of, of mosquitoes. And that can be transmitted directly to the enforcement uh, people who control mosquito breeding. Mm -hmm. So that's what I mean by, by ownership. And in the case of vaccine, it would be the same thing. The community leaders, the faith leaders, whatever it is in, in the Philippine civil society, um, must, in a sense, own the, let's say, the idea that the vaccine is valuable and do their bit in terms of communication and education and raising awareness rather than um, the whole thing being a top-down initiative on the part of the government okay it's more of a bottom-up community participation engagement and, and ownership and uh, uh, Singapore is just one particular good, good example Any other questions for Dr. Supi? If you have other questions, just uh, before I hear the next, how many of you know the historical fact that dengue actually started in the Philippines back mm -hmm. in the early fifties? It was known as Philippine hemorrhagic fever. Okay, long before it was actually identified as dengue. So you you've got a historical stake. <laughs> and it's now pioneering the implementation. So, other questions for Professor Pan or for Dr. Supi? Yes. It's getting interesting. Hi, it's me again. Um, I just want to know um, is this the closest to perfect solution? This vaccine is it or it needs? more tweaking um is this already close to the best solution? good question i was hoping somebody would ask me. okay as i said it is not the perfect solution but it's the best that we've got are we going to wait another 20 40 years are we going to wait for another hundred thousand cases my answer is no yes of course something we haven't mentioned there are other companies who are developing a dengue vaccine okay and two of those companies have claimed that their vaccine is 100% effective. I don't believe that, okay? And even if it was, it will take at least, at least three years before they get to the stage of the Sanofi dengue vaccine. And sure, I mean, I think it's, I have no emotional commitment to this vaccine, you know? Whatever works best, that's the way to go. But for the time being, it's the best that we have and we should go with it. The next level, just in case you know the strains add up, we still the study is still going on. Yes, of course. Yeah, uh, maybe Supin can answer that in terms of the, the longer term follow up, but you know, this is in relation to the sun of the vaccine. Okay, so, so indeed, when we develop our vaccine, we, we were following rigorously WHO guidelines as well. WHO issued some guidelines, specific ones about dengue vaccines and what you what the companies must do, the manufacturers must do to follow up the vaccine. Um, and they stipulated that at least five years of follow-up uh, following the vaccination course. And we followed that. So in fact, um, the companies that are starting phase three now, they're, we were there five years ago already. So you know, it's, it's, that kind of rigor is required of all the dengue vaccines that are going to come. Um, and we don't stop at the licensure. 
in the post licensure phase, it is also very important to continue to monitor um, for, for the safety and also the efficacy and the impact, the effectiveness and the impact to show the value, um, to really, really understand. So when it's used in a wider population, what is the value? There are other things that we can also learn as we continue with additional studies, which might be maybe to help make the schedule more convenient, for instance, uh, or to find perhaps other populations that today may be contraindicated and maybe tomorrow they could actually be vaccinated. So we continue on that effort. Um, as we learn more about the vaccine, we have always been transparently sharing this data, this information, uh, both with the regulators, but also with WHO, and also with the physicians uh, that are using the vaccines. But so far, there's not too many side effects to this. It's uh, pretty safe. In terms of the profile of the vaccine, uh, I, I know we have some people in the room who have actually received the vaccine and uh, they could probably share their experience with you as well. Um, really, when we look at, because we control with placebo, so placebo recipients uh, in, a, in a vaccine trial, they're just receiving like the salt solution. Okay? And the comparison that we make with that is it's really very, very mild in terms of the sorts of side effects that we're seeing. So, so with that respect, it is really a, a vaccine that is very, you know, very well accepted by, by the individuals. We also measure that when you look at our clinical trials, you know, we had to give the vaccine three, three shots over six months. And if the vaccine was extremely poorly tolerated, you would start seeing patients actually drop out of the trial, you know, and we saw an extremely low dropout rate. You know, 99, 97, 97 to 99% of all of the patients in these trials, they all continue all three doses. Telling you, they they found it very acceptable to remain vaccinated. Thank you. Um, <coughs> it's, uh, okay. it's, uh, <coughs> I mean, I, I have a slide I can that I that I can show you that this is a very active area of research. There, there are at least 15 different companies who are testing or developing new dengue vaccines. There are two vaccines which are already at the stage of doing clinical trials, okay? So, very active research field, but it's gonna be at least three years, in my judgment, that for them to reach this, this stage. And I, I think we can't afford to, 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 to wait uh, uh, that long. And um, the issue of safety, okay? It's come up a few times, you know? How will it affect my children? What are the side effects? Um, that is one of the unresolved, unresolvable uh, dilemmas in public health. What is more important? The risk and concern to individual children or adults who receive the vaccine or the benefit to the whole population? How do you make those kind of decisions? That's a tough one. You know, it requires courage, leadership, commitment. But you can't, you can't, if one child dies of the vaccine, that's it, okay? But there's absolutely no indication that that will happen. It's already been tested in 30, 40,000. And in the Philippines, nearly half a million kids have been given the vaccine without any adverse events. So to me, that's the evidence, you know, that, that uh, the implementation in the Philippines supported the initial uh, trial uh, results. I have a question for the doctor. Should you miss one of the three uh, uh, vaccines? Um, is there a, some kind of a certain period before you can have the vaccine again? Uh, our advice in general is that, you know, to just finish the course. So if missed for any particular reason at all, it just it should just catch up with it as quickly as possible. You don't have to. You don't have to restart. No. Okay. no. So the I understand the efficacy is about two to five years, right? So after that, I can I have the vaccine again. So we don't have. Uh, there is no indication right now that you need to be boosted. We certainly have these ongoing trials are going to help inform us whether a booster is required. But right now, we have no indication that a booster is necessary. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, it's, uh, George. Yeah, I'd just like to uh, give my two cents worth uh, uh, congratulations for coming up with such a vaccine. And I wish in the future, uh, maybe not necessarily for Sanofi, 
someone would develop a vaccine with the following side effects, you know, it will make you grow hair, <laughs> make you taller, <laughs> and increase your libido. <laughs> I, I left, my last slide was about flipping the model, and I, and I really just want to, if, you know, impress upon you um, how much the Philippines has really contributed to making flipping the model possible. It's, it's 20 years of, you know, uh, hard work in terms of research and development by our company, but it could only have been done with the clinical researchers, such as those that we've seen and worked with in the Philippines, and also the volunteers. We mustn't forget that the, you know, the, the patients who actually volunteered to enroll in these studies, so they've really contributed to helping us make this vaccine a reality. And, and the process that has been followed has been as rigorous as if it was the US FDA or the or European agencies in terms of the rigor. And it's really showing that you know, the uh, Asian countries, Latin American countries have the capabilities of if evaluating new vaccines and providing the approvals and now taking that one step further, which is to actually put the vaccine into use because the problem lies here. And so we need to really address the problem where the harm is. So really, this is a, a, an opportunity as much for the Philippines as well to teach the world how to do it well. Okay, just a quick few last words. I, I would absolutely uh, endorse what, what Suping has said. And uh, my hope is that uh, for the region and the countries in the region, especially where I come from, Indonesia, which has many, many, many more cases than you have, that they will follow the, the example of what you have done. And most importantly, to overcome what the last question mentioned, is this the best that we have? Can it really evolve? And as I said, it's the best that we have. And there are two sayings. One is that the perfect is the enemy of the good. Okay, so focus on the good. The second is that if the perfect is not possible, okay, then you try to make the next best one perfect. Okay, so I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much.